I am currently working for Amazon. I've been working as a product manager for the last two and a half years almost. Um, and today, and before that, I was working in the energy industry, which is a completely different uh, culture and company with different challenges. But I think in the, in the end, what matters is the product we design and how we launch it to the market, right? So the title for today was successful product design, but in the end, uh, what does it mean? No? What does it mean successful? Just because of a product having a great design doesn't necessarily mean that the product is going to be successful. Uh, history is full of, of uh, different examples where the product had great design, they launched it to the market, and they failed. We have many, many different examples. I have chosen just a few of them to illustrate what I mean. Uh, and probably for, I mean, this is a pretty young crowd, but uh, for those of you that were born before the 90s, maybe you remember that there was a system called uh, Betamax developed by Sony that was a video system for homes. It was launched in the 80s, and uh, it was a very specific standard competing with another standard that was created by a competitor, GVC and Panasonic, that was called Video Home System, VHS. But in the end, I mean, between these two different standards, the go-to strategy, the go-to market strategy, sorry, was different between the two. And uh, Betamax lost the battle. They only got 25% of the market share, whereas uh, VHS uh, was the, the winning one. But this product was better, was better designed. This product had uh, superior quality in the video resolution, uh, better sound, um, and they even overcome the biggest constraint they had, which was the duration of the tape. They could only record up to one hour. They solved that. They doubled the time they could record, but again, it was too late. They failed, and the product was great. Maybe you also know this, but in 1989, Pepsi, in the drink industry we have many examples like this one, but this is pretty funny, because Pepsi developed what they call the Pepsi AM. This was a, a drink, a Pepsi, that customers were supposed to drink for breakfast. Right? I mean, it's a, a Pepsi, they put 25% uh, more caffeine, they wanted to substitute coffee. They couldn't do it. And after a, f a year, they retired, the, uh, they, they cut off the, the production of this uh, drink. The next one is uh, also a more recent example. This is a, an actual picture of um, Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Maybe you remember, but a bit more than two years ago, in September 2016, Samsung launched the new Galaxy Note. It was number seven. Um, and after a month, they recalled all the devices because they discovered that there was a manufacturing defect with the phone battery that uh, was making the phone uh, do things like this. And basically, it exploded. So again, a great product with a great design that failed. So should we still talk about successful product design? I don't believe so. I think we need to just talk about product design, how to increase the chances of being successful when designing a product, and if at the end it fails, let's try to avoid someone pointing your, the fingers to us because we, we had a problem with the design in the very beginning, right? So just talking about product design, um, where do we start? When we uh, need to create a new product uh, for our customers, where do we start? How can we really understand the designing process, where we need to look at, what is the research that we need to make, where? And for that, uh, there are many, many innovation methodologies out in the market. Um, to name a few, you have here an example, so if you're interested in them, you can go online and check them out. There is um, design thinking, there is lean, agile, scenario planning, system design. There are many. The problem with these methodologies is that I don't believe there is always a, a one-size-fits-all methodology. So whenever it comes to the, the point where you need to create a new product, you can follow one of these methodologies. It's a great framework, but probably what it works for a company, it does not work for others. For each of you 
depending on your situation, on your company's structure, on the resources you have, uh, you might choose one of these methodologies, but I don't believe that following blindly these methodologies will ensure success. And in many occasions, I think they might lead to a waste of resources and time, whereas we can simplify this in a much easier way, okay? So again, <laughs> if we are not following any of these methodologies, where do we start? How can we create new products and ensuring that they will be successful in the future? Well, the answer to me is pretty obvious. It's something that it's been said a lot, but it's true. And the answer is customers. Whatever you do, you need to understand, first of all, in the very beginning of the design phase, who your customers are. Without that, for sure, you're set for failure. But knowing your customer is the first step you need to ensure to create great products and make sure that whatever you design makes sense. And get to know them, invest time understanding how your customers are interacting with the problems that you are trying to solve, uh, with the needs they are trying to um, fulfill. All of that is the first step you need to work on. Um, it's not a secret that Amazon, the company I work for, uh, strives to be the most customer-centric company in the planet, right? Uh, probably many of you uh, have heard about this. Prime is supposed to be a, a product that is suitable for each and every one of you. So if you are not yet a Prime member, it's a failure to us. But again, uh, how do we ensure how Amazon tries to ensure that it becomes, at some point in time, uh, the most customer-centric company in the planet? Well, there is a, a framework, or not a framework, or not a methodology, it's just an approach that I found extremely useful and yet very, very simple. And it's called the working backwards approach. Now, at Amazon, and this is a quote from our founder, Jeff Bezos, uh, we start with the customer and we work backwards. Right? How does it work in reality? How you can apply this approach to your own products and uh, when, when you need to design a new product for your company or your startup or your school, whatever it is? Well, uh, we normally develop what is called the working backwards document and it consists of uh, three different things. The first one is called the press release. And it's exactly that. So the press release is just a one-pager, a narrative. We love documents at Amazon. But it's a one-pager that describes the product that you're launching to the market as if you were releasing a press release to the media, to your customers, explaining what you just launched. Now, what are the features? Where are you launching it? You also include uh, some quotes from customers. Know, from uh, how, how they react to the product that you just launched. As if you were to publish this in uh, some um, media, newspaper, whatever it is. This is very simple. It has to be written in a customer-centric language, so something that can be understandable by anyone, um, and targeting the audience of your products, so your customers, again. This is a, a piece that is written for your customers to explain exactly what you are trying to build. And it's a leap in the future, imagining that you are months ahead, launching it already, and, and you are explaining that to the market. Then there is a second piece to the working backwards document, which is called the FAQs. The FAQs is just going into more detail. Why is that important? Because especially when you are designing products, you need to interact with many different teams and departments in your company. Teams that are not necessarily um, aware of uh, the product that you are building or, or, or that your necessities, your, your constraints. So you need to go to them, ask them, what do I need from you to make this product successful, to include you in the design of the product that I'm making? That is addressed via an FAQ, a question. It's a frequently asked question, just that. So, for example, I'm issuing a press release, and then someone in the audience saying, hey, why are we, why are we doing this only this talk only in Google Campus? Why are not we replicating this all over Spain in many schools? Well, you need to provide an answer to that. You know, if we were releasing this as a product inside the product school, 
we would be explaining why we are starting with Google Campus, with this talk, and what are our plans for the future. Now, you need to explain more in detail the rest of the features of your product. And this is via the frequently asked questions. And then the last one is a pretty obvious one as well. It's just the visuals. A picture is worth a thousand words, no? So it also applies for products. If you can show it, do it. It's a much better way of explain and illustrate what you are trying to build. And sometimes we only put uh, words in a presentation or in a business plan without creating wireframes, mockups, even a, a, a drawing on a whiteboard and a picture of that. If it helps you illustrate what you're trying to build, use it. It's going to save your time, uh, tons of time, actually. And, and uh, it's going to save uh, a lot of uh, churn and, and waste and throwaway work if you show from the very beginning what you have in mind via some visuals. Do it in the format that you want. But again, the working backwards document, something that we use a lot at Amazon, but uh, can work for any company in the world. I think it's a very simple way of understanding how you need to start thinking about the products and design them. But um, there is something that we normally forget about, and it's super important, I cannot stress this enough, that we always talk about this, well, not this vision, but the, the more boring version of the vision, which is the, the vision of the company. And uh, a vision is your roadmap, it's where you want to be in the future. You need to ensure that whatever you are building, is contributing to fulfill that vision. And it applies at every level, from the bottom to the top. It doesn't matter if you are building a new feature, or a completely new product, or a program, or a new business line, or if it's something that needs to fit in your department. It, every single vision at every step of a company needs to be aligned. Otherwise, again, there are more chances for failure. There are things that are not aligned with the purpose of the company. Why are you building them? Even if it's a feature, if it's not contributing to that, why are you building them? Spend your resources in a different thing. Try to find how to fulfill this vision, addressing other needs, other problems that your customers may have. Because in the end, if visions are not aligned, it creates a lot of barriers inside the, your own organization, even with the market. So. Again, um, maybe a, a good way of doing this is, or ensuring that the, uh, your vision is aligned, is if you're heading a department, if you are building a new product, you need to define some ground rules. You know, these are, uh, can be made in the form of uh, tenets or basic principles that you set up to make sure that in the future, whenever you are iterating your product, launching it to the market, pivoting, you, applying new things. Whatever you do, you need to come back to these rules and say, hey, I'm following these rules or not. These tenets, these principles that I am setting are the right ones. And this is, for me, something that will help you really uh, make sure or ensure that, that you are sticking to your vision. It's important, believe me. I mean, it saves you a lot of time. To give you an example of this, something that uh, caught me by surprise, Last year, I don't know if any one of you is working in uh, this bank, in BBVA. Is there anyone working there? No? Can I speak freely? Okay. I don't understand why a bank started selling meat, fresh products, in their marketplace. I still don't understand that. But in September last year, this, this is a press release. Remember that I was talking about uh, launching a product via press release? Well, this is the actual press release in Expansion, an economic newspaper. So they, they started doing this, and they were even financing uh, with zero interest rate, uh, rebuys, and zero loans. Okay, I mean, <laughs> they have a marketplace. It's probably a, a great product to build. Uh, be able to buy good meat, fresh, is great for customers, but is it really aligned with the vision of uh, a bank, this bank? I don't know, maybe, but I, I don't know how. So again, I think, I, I was checking just over the weekend when I was uh, preparing for this talk, um, 
if this was still live and I couldn't find any meat. So don't go online because probably they have discontinued this product. Because of the design, I don't know. Probably not the design, but really the misalignment with the vision. So again, this is, this is great. Um, I understand what, what I want to build. I have made this working backwards document. Um, I understand what I want to do, but I want to do it right. So there are many things that we can uh, talk about in product design in the different phases in how to really nail the PRFAQ or, or the, the working backwards document to explain and ensure that whenever it comes to executing this product, it will um, have higher chances for success, right? But I wanted to mention just three things that I believe are also super important and things that are very basic, very uh, obvious again, but are very important. And it can be applied to, again, every product, the small decisions or big business lines, whatever you are building or designing. Bear in mind that first, you make sure you understand the scope of your products. A product is not always built as a single thing standing in the middle of a company. It's a living entity inside an environment. You need to make sure you understand every angle of this product. I don't know if you have seen this, but this is a car-sized robot um, designed to explore Mars. Uh, it was launched in 2009 landed in March in 2012, I think. Um, and there was a contest to name it. Um, NASA made a context where children need to um, write an essay explaining their proposal for its name. Uh, they named it Curiosity. It was named by a 12-year-old um, girl. And the reason why uh, she chose this name was uh, because people ask her. That she loved uh, space exploration, of course. Um, and then people ask her, why do we need to go to, to space? Why do we need to explore a, a, a dead planet? And um, she answered, well, it's because humans are curious. No? And I totally agree with that. And I not only believe that humans are curious, I think that product managers needs to be more curious and always curious. Otherwise, they are set for failure. So this is, again, uh, one of the leadership principles that we have at Amazon. We have many. This is one of them. And it's probably the one that I find most interesting for product design, which is learn and be curious. I think there are many different ways of learning things, of being uh, curious about things, uh, things that you need to learn in depth, so things, for example, that are the core attributes of your products, the, the core departments you're working with, uh, the core uh, necessities that your customers have. You need to understand that in depth. So make sure you dive deep in every single step of the way. You need to become the experts of this problem. Uh, I was talking at the beginning about customers, getting to know customers. You need to be the experts of the necessity or the problem you're trying to solve. And don't be afraid of ask why and ask many times why. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, five whys. This is another, uh, I don't know, uh, methodology inside the, the lean approach, which is asking five times why to understand the root cause of an issue. Now, when you discover there is a problem, uh, you ask why, for example, I don't know, there is a customer calling a call center. You ask why this customer is calling, because the, the invoice is wrong. Why the invoice is wrong? Because there were uh, duplicated charges. Why there were duplicated charges? Because uh, there was a glitch in the system that duplicated the files that are taken in the invoices. Why there was uh, this glitch? Because the algorithm doesn't take into account the last step. You just restart again. So what is the root cause, the last one? If you fix the last one, you solve the customer problem. Now, you don't need to create a, a special service in the call center to address this issue. I mean, solve the root cause, ask five times why. And this also works when it comes to designing new products. Ask five times why things are like they are right now, because that will allow you to really go in depth in the problem that you are making or trying to solve in why it is or it hasn't been solved yet. 
you, you, you don't need to be afraid of asking why. And of course, there are other things that you need to be curious about. But it's, uh, th these are things that probably are not so important for the product. Typically, they are owned by different departments or, uh, or a colleague of yours or something like that. But it's things that are still important to make your product successful. But it's typically, again, not something under your control. But you need to know them, or at least know a little about, I mean, for example, uh, marketing is a typical example. Uh, if you are creating a new product, maybe you want to sync with your marketing colleagues to say, hey, what are we doing when we launch this? No, how is the go-to-market strategy? How are going customers to understand what we are doing? How they are going to uh, become aware of this new product? No? Um, again, there is a whole thing of, uh, or it's a completely different topic, no? launching a new product, but you need to understand the basics. You need to understand how you are going to market a product just because you might not need to be an expert on this, but you need to know the basics to never challenge why they are in this way, but at least get to know a little bit of um, why that matters for your product. Because as we were seeing at the beginning, some of these things might uh, make your product fail in the market. So it's important that you address them the sooner the better, right? The second thing that I believe it's also important is, is simplify your decisions. Simplify your decisions because um, along the way, when you're designing new things, you will uh, come up with uh, different features and, and many different things and challenges. And it will help you a lot if you understand what are, or which decisions are really important and which ones are not so important. You need to differentiate between this and this. This is a one-way corridor. Right? You have seen this in airports. It's typically a system that is placed in the um, areas where the, um, the, the security is uh, very critical. Right? Um, the characteristics of this is that once you go through that door, you cannot go back. Right? This is what we call a one-way door. On the other side, we have a revolving door, which, by the way, was invented in 1888. Um, and it allows people go in and out at the same time without blocking the door. And it's also very efficient uh, for heating and cooling systems, just as a fun fact. But uh, this is really a uh, two-way door. So when we are talking about different decisions in uh, product design, we might end up looking at two different things, two different decisions, one-way doors or two-way doors. It's important to differentiate these two things. Why? Because one-way door will take a lot of time to agree upon. You need to support your hypothesis very well. You need to prove that you are right because the risk is higher. The risk of doing something is higher because once you do it, you cannot go back to the initial state. Probably, I mean, uh, things like the Galaxy Note exploding is a one-way door. I mean, once you explode, I don't know, but 33% uh, of uh, the stock value uh, was lost. And it happens a lot with these big companies. You know, with big budgets, they failed and uh, their stock value suffered because these are one-way doors. There is no way they can revert to the initial state. No way. At least it's extremely painful and it will take a lot of time to do so. So one-way doors, try to avoid it. You will face some of them. And for those, uh, try to back up your decisions or your hypothesis very well because you will need a lot of support to uh, get the commitment and other teams or your management to make it happen. Whereas on the other side, the two-way doors are the things that we like. Two-way doors are things that we can test, that we can go one way, and if we don't like it, customers don't like it, we take it back. We go back, we iterate, we pivot, different, right? It's, it doesn't mean that it's uh, not uh, pain-free, so of course, taking always back from customers is painful, but it might not be uh, that uh, painful. No? I mean, it's, it's something that 
Customers will understand that it has changed, it has disappeared, but it's not creating any frustration on them. Uh, identifying these two types of decisions along the process of designing a product is going to save you a lot of churn, a lot of throwaway work, uh, a lot of time trying to convince people. Uh, if you let them know, hey, this is a two-way door decision, we can do this testing, and if we don't like it, if our customers don't like it, this is the plan to go back or to change it. Okay? Whereas in the other side, you need to be very, very bold in saying this is a one-way door. If we do it, we all agree, we commit to that decision, and that's all. Okay? The decision process is different, so try to differentiate between these two decisions. The third point, uh, it's something that, um, it's again, pretty obvious, no? but it's uh, collect as much feedback as you can. And I think that there are two different uh, types of feedback. Um, there is one that comes directly from customers, um, like this. You know, this is a consumer product launched to the market, and a customer is complaining, or maybe, I don't know, doing some compliments about it, but it doesn't look to me as she's happy. Um, these are real customers giving feedback on your products, on your designs. And there is a, another figure that I believe is also important, which is something that we have at Amazon. It's called um, Bar Racer. It's a customer experience bar racer. What does that mean? A, a bar racer is someone inside your organization uh, that is an expert is someone that is raising the bar for every product that is made and developed and launched to the market. Um, the difference between these two types of feedback is that, I mean, both of them, the common things are that both of them is something that you need to aim for and to get the sooner the better. The difference is that a CX bar racer or a colleague of yours that is an expert on that topic, on that product, or, you know, they probably did it last year, you are just replicating, launching this or uh, adjusting a product to a new market. Talk to these guys, talk internally, find who is the expert inside your organizations, who can you talk to to really uh, challenge your product design, challenge what you are trying to build. It has to be someone inside your own organization. Uh, it has to be very bold, so the feedback that you receive from them of course, it's, uh, I mean, always be positive with the feedback and constructive, but it has to be the truth, the naked truth about what you are doing. If you are doing something wrong, they need to be empowered to tell you, hey, you are building something that is not going to work. And if you are not, a, if you don't have a, a, a bar racing inside your organization, your team, your school, um, become one. Make sure that Again, you are curious, you are learning every aspect of your product, and you know everything about it. Have an answer for every question. Become a CX bar racer. So for future products, people will come to you and tell you, hey, can you give me feedback on this? This is an idea, I'm iterating it, I'm writing this working backwards document, what do you think about it? Ask for feedback to someone that is really an expert. And I'm, I'm sure you can find one. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be inside your own organization. That is the ideal case. But if not, find anyone else, maybe in other companies. Uh, we are now more open than ever uh, to share feedback on other products and other companies. So you shouldn't be afraid of that. Okay. And then the sooner the better, you need to test your product with the real market. You need to put it in front of the customers you're building it for. Uh, real customers. like. This woman, if you are building a consumer product and this is your target, if these are your customers, put it in front of her as, as quickly as you can. Because, again, this feedback will be always qualitative. It's not a quantitative research. It's something that you need to take with a pinch of salt. But it's really something that indicates you if you are in the right path, if you are really in the right direction, and uh, when iterating your product, you will be successful or not. So create these uh, safe environments of alpha environments or beta environment where you can invite people, friends, colleagues, uh, try to avoid personal connections, 
because products may fail in early stages, or sometimes people is just too nice. I mean, if uh, my brother is uh, asking me for feedback in a product he's developing, I might not be that bold to say, hey, your product is a shit. I mean, no. Probably I'll, I'll be nicer, and I'll try to say, hey, maybe you can improve it, maybe you can think about this little thing. I mean, it's, it's okay. So try to avoid these personal connections and uh, invite people to these um, alpha or beta phases that are not connected to you on a personal level so they can share their true feedback as customers. And if they are not true customers, find another one. But these two things are uh, things that I believe you can apply to your own organization um, probably now if you are building new products and see how it works. Okay. So it, I have shared with you three things that I believe are super important uh, when it comes to designing new products. We have talked about the working backwards document, the PR, the FAQs, visuals, how to structure your thoughts, how you can iterate and, and come up with great designs. No? Uh, you have identified one-way doors, two-way doors. You have learned about uh, other departments that are involved in, in your product. Um, all of that is great. But you might think, OK, yeah, I'll take this into account for my design phase, uh, but I can wait to execute this new product that I am inventing. And um, the, the, the concept of a design phase is, is something I disagree with. Um, and probably it's because it, I, I don't see it as a phase. This guy is called Noikari Kano. It's a Japanese guy who uh, invented in the 80s uh, a model that is called uh, the Kano model. And it's a model to measure customer satisfaction of different features or attributes in a product. This is the model. It's uh, a, a bit complicated, but uh, I'll, I'll try to guide you through it very quickly. So basically, Kano, what, what he said was, uh, there are five types of attributes in a product, or in a program, or in a service, whatever you want to call it. But uh, these five attributes, I'm going to understand how customers are satisfied or dissatisfied depending on how well or bad these attributes are implemented or built, right? These five um, types of attributes are the, the basic ones. This is uh, this line over here. What that's, that means is that even if they are fully implemented, customers will not be satisfied with them. The, I mean, the customer satisfaction will just be OK. But these are things that if they are not implemented, I'll be extremely dissatisfied as a customer. These are the things that customers take for granted. So again, something that customers take for granted is your basics in the product. It's like um, if you have uh, this, this uh, can, I mean, uh, they have many, many attributes in this can, right? The, 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 the brand, the color, the shape, the size, the flavor, many different things. The, the way it opens is the basic thing, no? When customer takes a, a can, it opens. If it doesn't open, it's extremely frustrating. Probably you have experienced that. It's extremely painful when you're trying to open a can and it doesn't open. This is the basic. Otherwise, you cannot taste the drink, right? So again, if it opens properly, who cares? I mean, it's OK. It's the basic thing. So it's not increasing your satisfaction with the product. There are some others that are things that are indifferent. I, don't, I just don't care. So why, why should I care about some things about this product? Why, why should I care about the, the, the font size of this or the, the, the language that they use, if it's formal or informal, about the, how to explain the ingredients? I just don't care. So if you can identify which are the attributes that your customers are indifferent with, you need to Cut the resources to that. I mean, stop investing time on those. People's, people just don't care. Customers don't care. There are others that are more interesting, which is, for example, these ones, the dimensional attributes. This is, for example, the flavor, following the example of the drink. The better the flavor, of the flavor is, the more satisfied I will be as a customer. If it's, it doesn't taste well, I'll be extremely satisfied. If it tastes great, 
I'll be extremely satisfied. And the last one, well, not the last one, because the last one is the reverse attributes, but we're not going to talk about them, the delight the attributes. The delight attributes are things that it's, when we talk about, we need to surprise customers, to wow customers, uh, to delight them, now are things that if I don't do it, customers will be still okay with my product, but if I do it, they will be extremely satisfied. It's like, imagine that in this scan, they will put um, a temperature indicator. If they don't do it, I, I don't expect it. I mean, it's okay. But if it would be cool to understand what's the temperature of the drink, and if it's getting cold or hot, and I don't want to drink it. It's something that might work, and if it's uh, well implemented, I might appreciate that a lot and be extremely satisfied. Now, again, why I was disagreeing with the design phase, why I agree with Kano, why I like this model, is because to me, as product design, we need to understand how these attributes evolve over time. And we need to realize that what, was, what once was um, a delighter over time, it will become a basic thing. Things, everything that you design will become obsolete at some point. It will become a commodity. So things that are sometimes or now seen as, Ooh, that's great, in the future it might just be a basic thing. We have seen this with uh, telecom products where you know, these flat rates for data was uh, the best part of uh, some products uh, years ago, and now it's just the basic thing to have, right? You can apply this to each and every market. It happens all the time. We evolve, and this, the lighters will become a basic thing. So I guess that over time, again, your product will become obsolete. Never look at um, design or product design as a phase because you need to always work on that. So I guess that my final advice to all of you is that as product designers, never stop designing because it's an endless job. That was all. <laughs>